So if we're lucky, we come away from our experience of school with one teacher that we really remember, somebody that really made a difference to us. For me, that teacher was a man called Mr. Sumner. He had a first name, but I didn't know it at the time. It's David. And he was my high school physics teacher. Mr. Sumner was an amazing teacher, and I had the occasion to get back in touch with him a few years ago. I was publishing a book that I had dedicated to him, and I wanted to send him a copy. So I tracked him down, and eventually managed to find a phone number for him. And I called him, and I said, I want to send you this book that I've dedicated to you. And he was very moved. And I said, the reason I, wanted, I dedicated it to you is because you were a very inspiring teacher. And the way you taught us science wasn't just to teach us facts, but you allowed us to talk around science. So when we talked about radiation, we talked about nuclear power, and we talked about the dangers. We talked sometimes about how science could be misused as well as used well. And I found that he could engage us in our science lessons. Really, before he even taught us anything, we were interested already. And when I told him this, I expected him to sort of wax lyrical about the joys of being an educator, about the, the, the marvel of working with young minds. And what he actually said to me was, yeah, I got out of teaching just after that, actually. And I was devastated. I was completely deflated by this response. And he now works as a land manager at a local farm. And I asked him why he had got out of teaching. And he said, well, it just became too difficult to do exactly that stuff that you were talking about. He said, the curriculum suddenly became overstuffed, and I just had to teach you facts so that you could pass exams. And that was it. And he said, that's not why I got into teaching. He said, so that's why I got out of teaching. And ever since that conversation for the past few years, I've been working as a science journalist and an author, and I've been peering over into science education, trying to work out where it's at and what the issues are. And I've come to the conclusion that there are three big issues that we need to solve if we really want to have great science teaching and produce great future minds. Those three issues are the stereotypes of science, the suffocation with facts, and the tyranny of having to be a success all the time as a student. So I'm going to start first with the, uh, the stereotypes. This is what a scientist looks like to a primary school child. This has been done in every culture pretty much in the world for the last 50 years. This is how an eight-year-old child sees a scientist. You will always get a lab coat. If it's got a pocket, there'll be pens in the pocket. If they have hair, it'll be wild hair. But most of the time, actually, you ask an eight-year-old to draw a scientist, and they, they come up with a bold man. And it's always a man. It's an incredible, strong stereotype that resonates in every culture across the world. This particular example was uh, drawn by a girl called Amy. And Amy is one of the lucky ones. The reason I say that is because Amy drew this uh, picture as part of a project where her class were going to visit uh, some scientists. They were traveling to Fermilab in Chicago in the United States. And uh, the class project was to draw a scientist and describe a scientist and then go and meet some scientists. This is how Amy described her scientists that she's drawn. I think of a scientist as very dedicated to his work. He's kind of crazy, talking always quickly. He constantly is getting new ideas. He's always asking questions and can be annoying. He listens to others' ideas and questions them. This is not a very positive image of a scientist that Amy has at this point. But the wonderful thing was, she and her class went to Fermilab, which is the, the premier particle physics laboratory in the United States, and they met loads of scientists. And then the class were asked to draw a scientist after they'd been on their visit. And this is the scientist that Amy drew. What a difference, isn't it amazing? For a start, it's a woman. Amy suddenly recognized that a scientist doesn't have to be male. She's kind of cool looking. She's got cool hair, big blue eyes. It's a very positive image. Amy clearly met some female scientists that she thought were great. This is how she describes uh, a scientist now. I know scientists are just normal people with a not so normal job. <laughs> scientists lead a normal life outside of being a scientist. They're interested in dancing. Who knew? Pottery, 
jogging, and even racquetball. Being a scientist is just another job which can be much more exciting. Amy's actually quite conflicted here because she wants to say it's just a normal job, but she actually has been there and she's seen that it's actually pretty exciting as well. So it's just a normal job, but much more exciting. So that's Amy. And the, uh, Amy has completely overcome her stereotype of what a scientist is. And there's plenty of research that shows that the stereotype of science, which is a universal thing across all of our cultures, actually puts kids off science. And it makes them think, this is not for them. This is not something they want to be involved with. So that's the stereotype. Let's talk about the problem of success. There's a physicist in the UK called Andre Geim, who works at the University of Manchester. A few years ago, he won a Nobel Prize for physics for his discovery of graphene. When he was talking about science and how he does science, he doesn't talk in terms of being a success. He talks in terms of a string of failures. He says 99 times out of 100, it doesn't work. Whether it's the calculation you're trying to do as a theoretical physicist, or whether it's the practical experiment that you're trying to do, most of the time he says it doesn't work. He says what happens is, occasionally, something fails to fail. And that's what we call a success in science. <laughs> I have a friend who's a working molecular biologist, and she often accuses me of, of glamorizing science. Uh, she says, well, you, as a reporter, you report on the discoveries and the breakthroughs, and it's easy. And you, you kind of give this image of, of science as being just one hurdle overcome after another. It's an amazing kind of roller coaster of discovery. And she says, the truth is, Michael, science is 99% heartbreak. Most of the things that you do don't work. She is with Andre Geim on this. It, just occasionally, something will work. Now, interestingly, when we teach our children at school about doing science practical experiments, we teach them to get it right or get a failing grade. The amazing thing is that you can do your experiment and get it right and not learn anything at all, really, because all you've done is actually uh, create the result that the teacher was looking for. You avoided getting a failing grade and you avoided getting that disappointed face that your teacher pulls so well. Actually, wouldn't it be a much better training, both for science and for life, if you were allowed to kind of experiment with your experiments and get them wrong? and have them go wrong, not get the result you expect, but actually then work out why you didn't get the result you expected. And kind of get yourself from that point where you get up off the floor and you do your experiment again, but you tweak something and maybe it'll fail again. But you get up and you tweak it again and then eventually you get a success. And suddenly you've learned resilience and you've learned how to cope with failure. And that's an important lesson in life. It's probably one of the, going to be one of the key skills that you need to succeed after your education, knowing how to fail successfully. So we need to deal with this kind of tyranny of success that we've created for our school children. It doesn't have to always go right. Let's move on to the issue of suffocation. So you probably know how annoying it is when you've got somebody who's constantly telling you about their successes. I did this so well. Oh, this really worked well for me. It's kind of not what we want to hear. And it's even worse if we hear that about somebody we don't even know. So imagine somebody telling you about how great this other guy is. And he did so much great stuff. And oh, it was amazing. He was so brilliant. Now imagine that you're a 14-year-old uh, girl. And actually, this is your teacher talking to you about a guy who's been dead for 400 years and how great he was. It's not really going to float your boat. It's not really going to get you going. Now, we expect our children at school, we expect our students to actually learn all the facts that were discovered about 400 years ago and since. And you probably don't get up to anywhere within 100 years of, of science, certainly not in physics. At school, you learn the sort of 400-year-old stuff, maybe a bit of 200-year-old stuff. But you're always learning stuff that people have discovered already. People have already done it. They've been there. It, and what you're asked to do is actually learn what they did, repeat what they did, do the experiments that they did, and then maybe write something about how great they were. I would suggest it's not that great an idea. But here's the really interesting thing about Isaac Newton, and that's Isaac Newton, by the way, in case any of you didn't know. It is a weird old man with wild, wild hair, but don't let that put you off. 
Isaac Newton actually wasn't really into learning facts. He was such a great scientist, probably the greatest scientist we've ever had in the human race, because he knew how to think. He actually knew how to think. John Maynard Keynes once said of him that he had what he called muscles of intuition, greater than any that any other man had ever been gifted with. He knew how to take a problem and think about it and keep thinking about it and press on through. And eventually, he got to the point where he could think it through to the point where he had a solution. So it's kind of ironic that when we teach our children science, we teach them really to copy what Isaac Newton knew and learned, rather than teaching, him, teaching our children how to think like Isaac Newton. And actually, if we could free ourselves from this tyranny of having to learn facts in order to pass exams in a curriculum that's way overstuffed, then maybe we could teach our children to think for themselves. And that would be something, again, that would be a vital skill for the rest of their lives. Here's an interesting quote. Science is cool and fun because you get to do stuff that no one has ever done before. That's not a quote from Isaac Newton, by the way. Neither is it a quote from John Maynard Keynes. Uh, it's actually a quote from these guys. This is a class of 25 eight-year-olds. These eight-year-olds worked with a scientist at the University College London who encouraged them to think for themselves. He said, what kind of experiment would you do? He visited their classrooms. What, what, what kind of thing would interest you? And so they did this project, these eight-year-olds, and they came up with it collaboratively within their class, and they said, we'd like to learn something about bees. And they didn't want to learn something that already, people already knew about bees. They wanted to learn something that nobody knew about bees. And so they asked questions, and they talked among themselves, and they sort of formed hypotheses. And they said, well, how is it that bees tell what color flowers are around? And what color flowers are more attractive to the bees? And what color flowers, um, in combination perhaps, make it easier for the bees to see the flowers they want to get to? And it turned out that nobody had actually asked this question before. You can go through the scientific literature. It isn't there. Nobody's answered it. So the children at this school said, right, well, let's answer it then. And they designed experiments. They formed hypotheses about what kind of flowers and arrangements would work. Uh, they tested them on local bees. They set up a, a bee matrix where they actually sort of did these experiments to look at how bees na navigated their way through different uh, types of color and different arrangements of color. And amazingly, they were then able to write up their results and publish them in a scientific journal. And this paper, Black Autumn Bees was published in a Royal Society journal. And part of the summation, the abstract at the top of the thing, was that quote that I showed you before. Science is cool and fun because we get to do stuff that nobody's ever done before. And they published it. And the, the journal didn't ask them to redraw their graphs and their charts with a computer. They said, that's fine, we'll take that. And so that's figure 1C that you've got there. And that's exactly how it appears, and it's now part of the scientific literature. And I think these children have overcome the stereotype. They've met a scientist. They've overcome the fear of failure because actually they took, took a long time to get their experiments to a position where they would work. And they actually overcome that need to just learn facts that everybody's learned before. They didn't learn facts that the previous year had learned. They didn't do experiments that the previous year had done or people had been doing for the last 400 years. They did something completely new. And I think the thing about this is that now they're ready for life in the 21st century. We have certain problems we need to solve. We know that we have problems with climate change and water shortages. We have energy droughts that are about to hit vast areas of the world. We have problems that we need to solve, and there's no guarantee, we have no evidence that the current way that we educate the next generation is going to provide solutions for those problems. We certainly don't see them coming at the moment. And so we need to actually not do business as usual. We need to change the way we educate. And particularly, I think, in science, where we are actually going to need these kind of scientific solutions and creative thinkers coming out of the woodwork and coming up with things that nobody could possibly dream of. And I think that if we can get rid of the stereotypes, and if we can get rid of the fear of failure, and if we can get rid of this suffocation of fact learning for exam passing, then I think we stand a good chance of creating 
a generation that can take on the challenges of the 21st century and win. Thank you. <laughs>